many clinicians are here today? Clinicians. OK, how many researchers? And how many family members and consumers? Family members and consumers? Oh, wow, what a nice mix, Kelly. Cool. OK, so and how many of you know the uh, app Waves? Yes. Oh, dear. <laughs> OK, well, for somebody who has absolutely no sense of direction, Waves is a miracle. Waves knows where you are. Might help if I turned it on. <laughs> okay, what about now? Can you hear me now? Okay, so Waze is in a magnificent app that will tell you wherever you are and get you wherever you need to go. It's just fabulous for someone who has no sense of direction. Well, you know what? Waze is similar to DBT. <laughs> because when you walk into a room and you've got all this complexity going on, you got to know where you're going and how you're going to get there. And I think DBT helps you do that. So we're going to introduce you to our client. Our client is a 14-year-old male. He has been diagnosed with uh, attention deficit disorder. And he has a history of recent drug experimentation with Cush. And when he was first seen, he was in his last week of being at an alternative school because he had been caught at school with a pipe. He has, uh, two weeks prior to his initial appointment, he tried to hang himself with a belt in a closet because his mother was paying too much attention to her mother, who has dementia. Anger episodes occur about every two weeks. He punches walls, destroys property, he hits or is physical with his mother, and he um, is stressed when he's stressed. The frequency goes up. <laughs> Hours after each incident, oh, and by the way, he is so cute. <laughs> I mean, I read this and I can't imagine what you're thinking, but he looks, okay, I, this is show my age, but he looks like a Boy Scout and he's got blonde hair and he's, little, he's small in stature and he comes in and he smiles at me, you know, and I just say, oh, he's adorable. <laughs> and then, <laughs> And then he says, yeah, you know, I hit my mom last week, you know. So anyway, I just want to give you a picture of, of the, di the difference in, in the way he presents and the way he looks in the office and how polite he is and how he plays and he teases. He hides from me. He'll hide, you know, he'll, like when I go out to the waiting room to get him, he's behind the door. And he jumps out and says, hi, you know. <laughs> and it's sort of the one of the ways he tries to connect with me is through play. Um, but... After, so he does this with his mom, he hits walls, he hits her, he gets her in chokeholds. And then hours afterwards, he's saying, oh, I love you. I love you so much, mom. I'm so sorry. And he's in tears. And I don't know why I do this. Um, and he seems genuinely remorseful. He was an easy baby, but he had anger episodes since three or four. Mom believes she contributed to the anger issues because she's been given in to him since he was a toddler. There's also been lots of chaos in the family. Dad left right after he was adopted. The biological mom lived with him and then left, and then the biological mom was killed. Um, they had a friend stay who stole their car, and there's, there's just ongoing chaos in the family. Uh, mom has difficulty with emotional regulation herself, and she will scream at him and say, why are you doing this? You're a loser. You're destroying this family. After all I do for you, guilt induction. And then she will randomly sort of respond by giving him what he wants you know, when he gets very, very upset. And, and then she will also say, but he's so sweet and he has such a good heart and he's just having such a hard time and look what everything we put, put him through. And so that's kind of, her reactions to him vary and they don't seem to vary based on any um, variable that we can find. They just seem randable, random. He doesn't have a group at school He'll say that he sits in the middle of the lunchroom. Do you guys know what the middle of the lunchroom is? No man's land. You know, what, the kids are in, in different corners. And in the middle, at least in this school, is kind of the kids that don't belong anywhere. And he says that he can be friends with all the groups, but he doesn't have any friends. But he wants to fit in all the groups. So, and he worries about how he dresses. And he wants to dress sort of preppy-like, but then he comes in, he will do a rap song. 
you know, and talk gang stuff. Um, he reacts very quickly to being rejected. And when he went back from the alternative school back into his regular school, he thought the kids were talking about him and that they wouldn't be friends with him. And so he was walking around with this sort of blank face. Of course, nobody <laughs> responded, right? Because he was like, and, but he was sure that everyone was talking about him. Um, he has a family friend that was taking him fishing. And it was great fun. But then the family friend said, you know, you shouldn't treat your mom that way or something like that. And he decided he didn't like the family friend, wouldn't talk to him, you know, turned away from him, wouldn't cooperate on a fishing trip, and is not going back. So we, um, we believe that he has high sensitivity to reward. He gets excited about things that might happen, but he also has high sensitivity to threat, uh, which means especially loss. And he's had a lot of losses. He's lost lots of homes, he, personal possessions he's lost um, because of the chaos in the family and the mom not being able to support them. Um, and they don't have a lot of resources. He's been in therapy since he was seven, and mom has also been in intensive therapy as well. That's our client. <laughs> We're going to use DBT. Do you think this person is um, appropriate for DBT? <laughs> Why? <laughs> Multi-complex issues. You know, DBT is not the therapy for someone who has anxiety disorder or simple issues like that. It's multi-complex issues and uh, dis ah, emotional dysregulation. And he has that. He has emotional dysregulation every day. His emotions change. So DBT is appropriate for him. And we're going to be using Alec Miller, Jill Rathaus's adaptation of DBT, DBT-A, DBT for adolescents. So what are we going to do? What do you do in comprehensive DBT, Kelly? So I want to say I, I'm really glad to be a part of this part of the talk because the other parts were kind of depressing. Um, and this is exciting. At least I think this is why Karen and I are excited because um, we get to actually see change um, and see this stuff really work. So the part where I think it was Carla had treatment works, we get to be a part of that, and it's really exciting. Some of you in here are also a part of that. Um, okay, so what makes uh, DBT with adolescents slightly, or, or children, slightly different? Um, I would say the big piece is the multifamily. So DBT is known for having skills groups. I'm assuming um, most of the people in here know what that means, but it's a learning environment. It's therapist becomes teacher. Um, the kids have books, or the teens have books. They come in, they have homework assignments. It's not a process group. It's not an emotional feedback group. It is a teaching, learning um, group. And the parents get involved in that as well. Either they're attending their own group or they attend a group with their child or teen at the same time. Um, the other thing that we do is phone coaching that I think is huge with this population. I was just talking to Elizabeth. I don't know where she went. Um, I, I want to change my coaching to Bitmoji coaching um, because I send Bitmojis and emojis constantly to my, to my clients to, to validate with you know high fives and thumbs up and all kinds of crazy things um, to validate what's going on and build the relationship and build trust and all kind of stuff. And texting is the way they communicate, so we kind of have to do that. Um, case management is another piece that we do. I'm glad, as a social worker, I'm glad that part is in there to where we look at the environment. We go and we talk to schools and we give them education on what they may or may not be reinforcing in a school environment. Um, and we step in when we can in that way. And the other huge piece um, is team. So Karen and I are doing this talk together. Um, we're used to working on a team um, because this is really, really hard work. And um, we couldn't do it without having support of other therapists on a team. So yeah, did I get all of that? And then of course, individual sessions. So when we go in, when I go into that therapy room with, I'm gonna call him Garth, the funny thing is I've been thinking about, he's new in the practice, and I've been thinking about it, and I, um, I keep saying Garth in my head so that I don't say his real name. Well, the other day, I called him Garth. <laughs> I, was like, I said, no, no, no. <laughs> but anyway, so when I go into the room with Garth, there are certain assumptions that I have in my head, and these are the assumptions from DBT. The, we have assumptions about clients as well as assumptions about therapy. And the first assumption is that clients are doing the best that they can. So Garth is in the waiting room. He hides from me. He jumps out. The other people in the waiting room are looking at him. And he comes down the hall. And this is the way Garth comes down the hall. He's touching everything that he possibly can. 
Um, so that, and then my office, when he sits down, he's up and he's down. And he's over and there's a little niche that he can hide in and he'll hide in the corner. He hides behind the tree. So this helps me when I remember he's doing the best that he can right now. Clients want to improve. Um, a lot of times when we're working with people who um, have been diagnosed with BPD and have BPD, the emotion changes that they have can be discouraging to the therapist, especially when they're angry at you. You know, they come in and you're the best thing that they ever met, you're the most wonderful person, you're the one that's going to make the difference, and then, you know, you're the opposite. So when we go into the room, we remember that clients really want to improve, that they're doing the best they can, and that they want to improve. And whatever's getting in their way is actually part of the illness. It's not, it, too often it's easy to say they're not motivated, or they're, they're not trying, when actually it's part of the illness. And then they also, this is a sort of dialectic, right? Um, they need to do better, try hard, harder, and be more motivated. So at the same time, they're doing the best they can, and they can do better. So we hold that all the time in the room. Clients must learn new behaviors in all relevant context. They cannot fail. Clients in DBT, the therapist walks into the room, the client cannot fail. Clients may not have caused all their own problems, but they have to solve them anyway. The lives of severely dysregulated individuals who are suicidal are unbearable as they're currently being lived. So when I walk into the room, those are the assumptions that are in my head. Now the assumptions about therapy. So the most caring thing we can do is help clients change in ways that bring them closer to their own goals. So we'll talk about some of Garth's goals, um, but it's his goals. It's not what we want for him, it's what he wants for his life. Clarity, precision, and compassion are the utmost important. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. This one's my favorite, actually. Uh, the therapeutic relationship is a real relationship between equals. I think that is a very big difference in DBT and some other different modalities, is that we are really equals in the room. I, I may have some more knowledge about emotions or different things, but I'm no way better than you in any of, I'm an emotional being, I can get dysregulated myself, I can get mad, I have to use mindfulness just like everybody else. My brain, you know, isn't always in, within my control. So it's really looking at, we are equals here in this room, and I love that. Um, be, uh, principles of behavior are universal, affecting the therapist no less than the client. So this is a huge one that we talk about a lot in our team meetings, about our own interfering that we can bring into the room, and we really want to own that, and own that with our clients as well. It's also that our clients can teach us to be bad therapists. Because someone who, um, well, Garth, for example, has a lot of hard, he has a difficult time talking about things that are uncomfortable for him. So his message to me when I bring up things that are uncomfortable to him are, leave it alone, lady. You know? And I don't want him upset. He's cute. He's a boy scout. You know? And so when he starts sending me that message, I need to remember that uh, he can shape my behavior so that I'm not addressing what I really need to address. And my team helps me with that too. We can fail. <laughs> they can't fail, but we can. And DBT can fail even when the therapists do not. So yeah. And that's back to the team. So we need, we need support in doing this work. And part of that is back to what Karen was saying, is working with BPD because it's such a dramatic, erratic, dysregulated, you know, thunderstorm that we are so often shaped. And without that team saying, why aren't you checking in about this? Or Karen, why haven't you, you know, really stressed that in session? It's like, oh, I've totally been shaped to not bring up his mom in session or to whatever it may be. Yeah. So we're walking into the room with those ideas. You know, buy into those to be a DBT therapist. And that's the way we walk into the room. That's the set in the room. And then we also are, we try Think dialectically. And one of the reasons we think dialectically is because people with a borderline personality disorder, teenagers included, they go to extremes. And, they, and so you can get polarized so that you're on opposite sides. If you get on opposite sides, you're going to lose your client. So when we think dialectically, we're figuring out ways to be on the same side. What is the truth? Even if it's a kernel, just a small part of truth and what that client's saying that we can agree with and get on the same side and understand from their point of view. What is it? 
You know, it's like, have you heard the story about the boy and the pony? It's an old story. Have you heard it? Okay. Um, there was a farmer and he had a little boy and he went out and this little boy was digging in this big pile of horse poop. And he kept digging and digging and the farmer says, what are you doing? Why are you digging in this pile of horse poop? And the little boy says, with all this poop here, there's got to be a pony somewhere. <laughs> and so sometimes when people exaggerate things, when they give you things that aren't helpful, they tell you things that aren't true, but you look for that kernel of truth, what is it that they're trying to communicate to you? And that's part of dialectical thinking. We're also constantly looking at what's being left out. The picture's complex. And so we are looking all the time, constantly, what have, do we not have in our head? What is it we need to kind of understand what to do with this client? And dialectics comes about in DBT in another way, too. In fact, the core dialectic in DBT is the balance between acceptance and change. And the primary acceptance strategy in DBT is validation. And validation is really recognizing that someone's internal experience is understandable and makes sense. And if you're looking at someone who doesn't know who they are, they don't know how they think about things, they don't know about the, if their perception of the world is accurate or not, and so much they're responding from emotions, validation, which you only validate the valid, helps them figure it out. So you're reflecting back to them what is true, what is accurate, how are they coming across. And validation is one of the ways that they help build a sense of identity, as well as it can be very regulating. We also talk about secondary targets. When you bring dialectics in, and this is the philosophy of DBT, that we're going into that session with Garth, we also talk about secondary targets. So on one side we have apparent competence. So this is where at times Garth, I don't know how often he looks this way, um, but looks like he's got it all together, right? And so you may not really see what might be underneath it. Um, and then the opposite end of that is active passivity, that I am working so hard to get other people to do things for me. But I'm working so hard at that. <laughs> um, and then maybe you want to talk about the vulnerability with Garth? So in the secondary targets, you know, we're looking at opposites. And what we want to do is help people get to the middle. So Garth has an emotional vulnerability. And what is emotional vulnerability? Emotional vulnerability in terms of secondary targets means that he is aware there's something different about him. And he will say, I don't know why I get so angry. I don't know why I can't control it. I don't know why I hate that I do that. And I heard this morning that someone say, I think it was Carla maybe, that was saying that adolescents are actually more open about their symptoms than the parents are. And that, I was like looking at him because he, he's 14, he looks more immature and he's sitting there saying, I don't know why I do this. And it breaks your heart. But that's the emotional vulnerability. The problem is it goes up and down with emotional um, invalidation or self-invalidation where he then turns and says, I'm a loser, I'm flawed, there's something wrong with me. I, and that just builds a whole lot of depression, anxiety, and uncertainty in him. And he goes back and forth between those. I don't understand why I do it, and I'm a jerk because I do it, basically. Um, he also does unrelenting crises and inhibited experiencing. Unrelated crises in his life are they stole the car, they don't have a car to drive anywhere, and a lot of them come from him. He tore up the house, he, he crashed his mom's, he flushed his mom's phone in the toilet, he tore up, uh, he stole money, and then she gets angry. So a lot of the crises come from him. But the other part is the loss of a friend who moved away, the only friend that he had. Dad, who moved out, doesn't come around very often. You know, he has so many losses. The loss of mom because she's got to go take care of grandmother. Um, the moving, they move repeatedly. And there's not enough time to, um, to experience those emotions and grieve. And right now, he doesn't have the capacity for that either. So when I go into the room, I'm thinking about balancing that. I have to help him have skills to be able to manage those secondary targets. I've got, he has to have skills to manage the emotions so he can grieve. He needs to have skills to be able not to contribute to the crises that are going on in the home. And so those, that's all in my head when I go into the room with, with Garth. The family's also got dialectics going on. And the dialectics with the mother, with this particular mother, I haven't really seen so much forcing autonomy versus fostering dependence, you know, trying to keep him too close, doing too much for him, or pushing him out of the house. I haven't seen that. It's new. 
It's, it's new in treatment, maybe I will. But what I have seen is normalizing pathological behavior and making light. Oh, he's, he's just had a bad day. You know, why don't you understand? I don't know, my friend who took him fishing, he shouldn't have overreacted. My, you know, Garth just had a bad day. And then normalizing uh, pathologi patholo oh, that word, normal <laughs> behavior, pathologizing normal behavior, uh, she does that too. And so he'll do something simple, uh, like be upset because he can't go to the dance, and she'll talk about how entitled he is and how spoiled he is, and then it's all her fault, and it goes back to her. So those are the dialectics we look for in the family, and we want to get them to the middle of the, the middle path, which is not so extreme. We're trying to, to treat people to get them out of extremes. Extremes cause misery. So overview of an individual session. What are we going to do in this session? So the, I'm going to give you first a picture of, you know, you've got the philosophy, you've got the dialectical thinking that I'm walking into that session with. Now here's the structure of the session. And the structure is when it starts, I'm going to give an overly exaggerated greeting because teenagers, number one, do not read faces well. Their brain is not developed to the point that they recognize the social signals. They see caring as anger sometimes. And so I'm going to go, hey, how are you? I mean, he's behind the door, right? So I'm going to be, yes, glad to see you. Come on back. I'm giving him acceptance, validation and acceptance that he's wanted in that session right away. And then uh, I, at the same time, I'm checking out how is he responding to me? Because we've got to keep this relationship going to keep him in treatment. And I, if I see anything wrong in the relationship, I'm going to address it right away. It's going to be a primary target. And then I'm going to ask him for the diary card, from the diary card, we're going to talk more about the diary card in a minute, and then from the diary card I'm going to create an agenda which structures the session. This young man does not have structure in his life, he does not know how to monitor his own behavior, he does not, not know cause and effect. The diary card is going to, it helps me when I'm not with him, his just recording the diary card is therapeutic. Plus, it gives me a picture of his week, and we'll show you that in a minute. Um, and I'm going to get a commitment from him. Okay, okay. Is there anything you want to put on the agenda? How's this? You ready to go? Let's go. And then we start down the agenda. Um, we're going to treat the first target by doing a chain analysis, figuring out what caused the behavior, what was in his head, what the problem behavior was, what the consequences were, and we're going to show you a chain in just a few minutes. And then we're going to do a solution to the chain, and then we're going to repeat with other targets. Then I'm going to do a little bit of a session ending ritual so I can give him a heads up getting ready to leave because remember separation for people with BPD is not easy and even separating this in, from the session can be difficult sometimes and so um, that is in general the session but at the same time we've got all these tr change strategies DBT is basically a cognitive behavior therapy and so all of these strategies are the strategies we use to change. We're known for skills. I think that's what people think of when they think of DBT. But we also do lots of other things to help bring about change. And we may talk about some of those, hopefully, if we, get some, if we have time. So in addition, we have validation that we are constantly balancing with change. If we, get, if we push too hard for change, we're going to lose our client. If we push too hard on validation and not enough on change, we're not going to get any change. So we are constantly balancing on a tightrope between validation and change. And then there's the dialectical thinking. And dialectics is brought in with a client when they, have, when they are too rigid, when they get into a rigid box and they can't move out of it. The only way I can ever be happy is if I have a new car of my own and I can move to Los Angeles. That's the only way I can ever be happy. Okay? That's rigid, right? So with rigidity, we start to use uh, dialectics to help people move out of that kind of rigid thinking. And then we've got the assumptions we talked to you about, and we've got stylistic strategies, the way we interact. Sometimes we're warm and accepting, and sometimes we're irreverent. So that's all you have to do. <laughs> In 52 minutes. <laughs> So uh, the first thing, in the first four sessions, one of the things we do is we get something to help us motivate the client. So if I went around here and I said to every one of you, in your heart of hearts, what is the life you really want to live? What is it? And then I want details. Tell me about it. Tell me about it like a movie. 
And that's what we do in DBT. And that 14-year-old looked at me and said, now remember, this is a new client. He looked at me and said, I want less chaos in my life. I don't want to fight with my mom so much. And I want to have more friends. And I want to grow up and be a detective. And I just want to have a normal life. What does a normal life mean? A normal life? Well, it means that my mom doesn't have a friend over who steals our car and that we can wake up and do the, sort of the same thing every day and that I don't go to school and get in trouble and just normal, lady. <laughs> <laughs> I think my, my favorite thing about this too is A, for as a therapist with BPD, you can get lost in so many things and this is the anchor that I think throughout the entire thing of treatment, I think he wants to be a detective, he wants a normal life and anytime we're away over here, it's like, but wait, I thought you wanted to be a detective. How are you going to do that if you run away tonight? Or whatever, right? Like, we can always sort of bring it back to that, that anchor, and this comes from them, and it's their language, and it's their words, and it, I, I'm always shocked about what they say. It's always a really beautiful thing that they say. Yeah, I used to think that, because I love doing therapy, I love being a therapist, I used to think, how wonderful to come to therapy. You get to come and talk to somebody about how you feel. Isn't that wonderful? It was a shock to me <laughs> that a lot of people hate, come, and especially teenagers. I mean, I'm serious. Teenagers hate it. And so this is how I'm trying to hook him. Every time I talk to him about you know, beating up his mom, you know, how does that fit with what you're trying to get in your life? So remember the structure of the session? So I've done the greeting. And I've got to put targets on that diary card. So in the first four sessions, when you get the Life Worth Living goal, you also get targets. And DBT, this is like, you know when you're in a snowstorm and it just keeps storming and you're shoveling, shoveling here, and then you turn over here and you shovel over here, and while you're over here, that hole fills up? You know, sometimes, you know, working with uh, clients with so many problems, it's like that. It's like, what do you deal with first? And, you know, we dress like something different every week. DBT tells you how to do that through the structure. Number one is always you have to have a client that's alive. And so life-threatening behavior is always your first target. Suicidal ideation, suicidal behavior, self-harm behavior, um, homicidal behavior, always your first target. Then the second is therapy interfering behaviors. Because um, people who have BPD, you know, they struggle with relationships. Well, guess what therapy is? You know, it's, it's a relationship, right? And so they're going to do a lot of things that interfere. And you're sitting here saying, I can help you get well. Why, do you, why are you fighting me? You know, and it, they don't have those skills. So we target how to be a good client. And I like that because most of our clients come because they've been kicked out of therapy multiple and multiple times from other therapists um, or been in and out of treatment for, for years. And so we, we, we immediately address that. We own it. We say, this is why you're here. So, of course, it's going to come up. Of course, you're going to do the same thing to me that you do to your best friend, that you do to your partner, that you do to your mom. And we're going to work on it. And I'm not going anywhere, but there are things that I might do so that we can, these behaviors will change. And it's just, it's laid out right in the beginning. And then the third target for stage one is quality of life interfering. That's where the anger goes. Okay? And so we, we're going to track these, the anger, the quality of life interfering, and the suicide and the self-harm threatening behaviors on a diary card. We're also, those are the things we're trying to decrease. Now, we're also trying to increase. We're trying to give skills. And in DBT, there are four categories of skills. Mindfulness, how to be in the moment, how to think about what you're doing before you do it, distress tolerance skills, how not to make it worse, um, interpersonal effectiveness skills, how do you make friends, how do you have a relationship, how do you, tell how do you ask for what you want, how do you say no, and middle pass skills, which are... Uh, like for parents and kids, how do you work together in order to make home life less chaotic? Mm -hmm. So is this Garth here? This is a diary card. Okay. This isn't Garth. Yeah. <laughs> so this would be an example of a diary card. And what's really important is that the top part is you and the client. We come up with this stuff together. Um, Those are the targets. Right. So, you know, we obviously are going to be addressing the self-harm and suicide stuff first, but then these other things on here, he has said, yeah, we've got school problems, so we're going to take a look at that. Yeah, I've got, I really want to have normal friendships, so let's start looking at when you have problems at school. 
In the beginning, we're just tracking, right? We're not really doing any change. We're really just tracking. And what's not up there oh. is drugs. Right. Just the craving. And that, but, and all the reason we're on tracking that is because he doesn't really want to stop. Mm -hmm. So we, we can't, we can track it, but we can't target it in a session. So yeah, the only thing we, like, it, we have to track, that they have to be committed to work on is staying alive and coming to therapy. If you want to keep doing drugs, if you want to keep hitting your mom even, okay, we won't track that as long as you stay alive and you keep coming to therapy. That's our, our number, which sounds kind of crazy. <laughs> but ironically enough, right, when we work on those two things, we eventually start working on the other things. But it's their goals. Oh, and here are all the skills. So some of you may know what these are, some of you may not, but here's just a snapshot of some of the skills. So then eventually he gets excited and he goes, oh my gosh, Karen, look, I did one mindfully four times this week and he's got it checked off. Or I did a dear man to my mom and I got my phone back without choking her. This is amazing, star on Wednesday, right? So eventually we'll get to that point where he's identifying when he's using skills. So the second time that I, the first time that I saw him, he talked about an issue with his mom and I gave him a skill to use. And so he's up, he's jumping around on my couch, he's going all over. I have no thought that he's gonna do this skill, none. But I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm an optimist. He comes back, back next time and said, hey, it worked. What worked? <laughs> you told me that if I smiled at my friends in the hallway instead of just looking flat and looking at the floor, that maybe they would talk to me, and they did. And that's like gold, because then he's got more confidence in me, right? Yeah, because some thing I told him uh, to do worked. But the point for me more is that sometimes teens look like they're not listening to you. Sometimes they look like they're not going to do what you say, and they are. They so much want their lives to be different. This is Garth's beginning card because Garth, as as I mentioned, has been diagnosed with attention deficit. He doesn't like to pay attention to things. He doesn't want to track. So we, uh, I'm going to shape his behavior to get to the other diary card. But this is the one we're starting with, which is very simple. And you can see on the diary card what we're going to target. We are going to target the problems with friends if we can. But on Sunday, I have anger with mom. And I have a physical altercation with mom. So that's where we're going to start. And I want to do a plug for those of you that don't know the DBT diary card app for the iPhone. It is amazing. I use it a lot. It, it tracks, it does graphs, they can email me a PDF before the session. It's fabulous. There's skills, there's even a coaching section, and it's like five bucks. It's only for iPhone though, but there's no Android, so if somebody wants to go make money and make one, please do. How are we doing on time? Oh, good question. 2.22, so 20 minutes, is that right? 20 minutes. Okay, okay so. 20 more minutes though? All right, so he's in my office, right? You got the history, right? He's kind of sitting in my office. <laughs> um, I've got the diary card. We've got the targets. So what I've got to understand is what is going on with this behavior. The way I change this behavior is by knowing what controls it. And DBT is a behavior therapy, right? So we're going to focus on behavior. And the way that we do that, our sort of x-ray of behavior, if you will, is chain analysis. And so I start with the problem behavior. The problem behavior is beating up mom. So that's right there. So what I'm going to do next is I could go to vulnerability factors. And vulnerability factors are just things that make it more likely to happen at that time. Not enough sleep, didn't take his medication, uh, hasn't had anything to eat. Um, somebody called him a name at school earlier. That, that got him a little bit dysregulated to start with. So those are the vulnerability factors. But what I really want to know right now is what's the precipitating event and what are all the thoughts and feelings and body sensations that happen between the precipitating event and the problem? And then what happened afterward? And that's going to help me come up with a controlling variable. So let's look at a beginning chain. So this is a beginning chain with Garth. So what happened was mom took his phone. Now what do you remember that I told you earlier that might, make, might come up in your minds right now? What about Garth did I tell you early on that might bring something to your mind about why this would be so important to him? 
loss mm -hmm. and friends yeah. and friends connection this you know he's lost so many people in his life and the phone is his connection to people and so it's more than a phone now every teen right cares about a phone but to Garth this phone he I mean he holds it in my office he's not looking at it but he holds it he won't let me touch it you know so that's validation <laughs> so what happened, and I, I'm not clear yet, because he's not clear yet, but what happened when he woke up and realized that mom had taken his phone, she took it while he was asleep, which, okay, unpredictable, right? But she took it while he was asleep, and you can kind of understand from her point of view, she doesn't want the argument that's going to come. But what results is he has a sense of panic when he can't find his phone. He wakes up, he you know, keeps it in a certain place right by him, it's not there. And so he wakes up in a panic, she took my phone, and there's a tightness in his chest. Now I don't know the order yet, because he doesn't know the order yet. He goes out and he says, give me my phone. Mom yells, no, you never get out of bed, I'm keeping the phone, who pays for it? And, and mom's losing her emotion regulation here too. And so he can't think. And this is when he says, I just get angry. I just, I lose, I can't, I don't know what I'm thinking. And I can't stop myself. And I just get angry. And he puts his mom in a chokehold. He gets the phone. Mom gives him the phone. Later, Hours later, I can't control myself. I'm ashamed of myself. I don't like who I am. Mom, hey, I love you, Mom. When are you coming home, Mom? I'll see you after school. You know, because he doesn't want to be left and he doesn't want that loss. This isn't complete because, as I said, he's a new client. We're just learning about him. But what we have here are ideas about how to intervene. I can intervene, perhaps, in the green circle. He gets his phone. When he puts mom in a chokehold, or he hits her, or he gets physical with her, a lot of the time he gets his own way. So I could change that. If you were me, would you want to start there and try to get mom not to give him the phone? Would you? To stay in the chokehold and hold onto the phone? Yeah. <laughs> Is that what you want? I wouldn't because I don't think mom has the skills. And so if I try to intervene there, especially in the very beginning, I'm going to lose the confidence of my client. And I may make things a lot worse. So I don't want to intervene there. Am I going to intervene in trying to help him calm his anger. Am I going to say, okay, I want you to breathe when you start to get angry or something like that? Am I going to do that? No, I'm not going to do that. He can't, he, he, he has this, you know, like there is a, emotions come about in like, I think four seconds. I'm sure there's a neurologist here, but something like four seconds, but we don't even label them until after that. And so he, I, he seems to be reacting almost physiologically. Um, and I think it may be classically conditioned because of so many losses that he's had. So for me to tell him to breathe when he's angry is also probably not going to be very effective. Where I'm going to try to intervene is when he, um, in the panic, when he wakes up and feels that panic, I'm going to try to intervene there. And there's a skill called tip that when he feels himself flush and get excited, he hasn't left his bedroom yet, that maybe he could do that and calm himself physiologically. You want to talk a little bit about TIP? Sure. Yeah. So what I really like about DBT is, or there's a lot of things, but in particular that it, we have a lot of skills that address physiolog physiological responses that um, come either before or sometimes after emotions. And so we can't go cognitively with this kid, right? We can't do any sort of restruct cognitive restructuring or cognitive modification about, um, let's think about the way you think about this phone when you see the bedside table and no phone. We can't change any of that because he immediately goes into this fear response. His brain goes on fire, right? And then he storms downstairs and milliseconds later, his mom's in a chokehold, 
right? So we have these skills, one of them is tip, that will change his physiology. You know the, the term chill out that people say? Or you just go cool off, right? Tip is actually a skill from that kind of cliche to go and dunk your head in a bucket of ice because his, that will change, literally, his, the physiology, his physiological response of his body and like tone down his right brain so that he can start to bring some of his prefrontal cortex back online to actually have some cognitions that might make a bit more sense than I really want to go choke my mother right now. Um, but that's not, that's not going to come online until his, his physiology changes. So tip would be he immediately goes, dunks his head in some ice or goes and gets in a cold shower, something to literally cool off his body, do some then intense exercise. So we do push, I do push-ups in session because they're really hard for me, or we do wall sits. Um, sometimes you can run in place, but you definitely don't want to do anything that's associated with violence. So we don't want to go punch a punching bag or punch a pillow or scream or do anything like that. Um, and then the, the P is for progressive muscle relaxation, which some of you may know what that is, but it's, on, it's consciously tightening up your muscles for a few seconds and then releasing and going through kind of the whole body doing that. So if he can do that, if he's willing to do that, and we will practice that, I'm sure Karen will practice that with him in session over, over, and, over. and over and over and over again so that he starts to train himself that when he sees that missing phone, he immediately starts doing something, something different with his body. So at the same time that we, we, I'm teaching the skill tip, I'm also doing something called informal exposure therapy because I'm going to role play mom. And I'm going to say, no, you can't have your phone. And then he's going to do the exercise. He's going to put the cold. And it's, we have a lot of fun with it. You know, we joke around. But I'm trying to get him, I'm working on the classical conditioning part where he's just reacting to a word that this, no, I can't have what I want. No, I'm going to lose. This is going to be horrendous. Um, I'm working on that. At the same time, I'm giving him a skill for something to do. And so as we practice that, we role play it, I'm going to give him something to put in his room to remind him. I'm going to send him home with an ice pack. I'm, going, I'm giving him a pink stress ball to hold in his room while he does the jumping jacks as a reminder. So we're trying to set up cues in the environment to do something different, a new type of behavior. So this chain analysis, you can see where we look, the controlling variable, that's what I'm aiming for. You know, the controlling variable is mom saying no, taking something that's important from, to him away, and the fact that his behavior works. So I've got to work on both the operant side, the consequences where his behavior is working and change that. So I'm going to put mom in the parenting class, get her some skills. I'm going to start working on mom being able to say no, and I'm working on the classical condition as well. So change strategies. We have a lot, a lot of change strategies in DBT to choose from. Do you want to talk a little bit about them? Sure, sure. So one of my favorites is exposure. And that's kind of what Karen was saying about. So in the session, we would say, I would say no a lot. Like, no, you can't turn your head to the left for the rest of the session. We're going to be like this the whole session. Or whatever. Do silly things with no to get him exposure to the word no. Eventually, I'd love for him to put his phone, he holds it in his hand, but maybe even set it next to him and then further away and then further away. Um, the kind of exposure exercises. Um, like that. A lot of people don't associate DBT with exposure, but there's a lot of exposure in DBT. Do you want to do another one? Want me to do another one? Uh, cognitive modification. We do cognitive modification in DBT, but a lot of it is contingency management, which is if you do this, then this is likely to happen. If you think, if you think this way, then this behavior is likely to follow. What we're trying to do is teach cause and effect, thinking ahead, and the way events connect together because they don't see how their behavior connects with the consequences. It's like the world is just unfair, right? And they don't see how what they're doing brings uh, certain results to them. Um, we do a lot of highlighting, which is um, just a way of saying, have you noticed a pattern here? And he knows the pattern about his mom saying no. He could tell me that. I said, hey, it seems like whenever your mom says no, he says, yeah, I don't do good with no. Um, problem solving is um, it's interesting because part of the theory in DBT, uh, in, uh, yeah, DBT for problem solving is that they grow up in families where families don't know how to problem solve. And so families sort of treat it as oversimplified and say things like, well, just get your grades up, then things will be better, you know, or just uh, go get a job, then you can pay your bills, or just smile at people, you'll make friends, or just join a club and uh, you'll find friends that way. Well, so 
it's because the family doesn't know how to solve problems either, and that's not something that we teach, really. So in DBT, we do some problem solving, where we teach them the steps of going through solving a problem and being able to regulate the emotions as they go through and address the problem. Um, contingency management is about the consequences of behavior, like if he keeps beating up his mom and getting what he wants, that, that behavior is going to continue. So contingency management sometimes is going in the environment and changing what happens as a result of their behavior. So when we're in session, these are the strategies that we have to choose from. And we do do, so the cognitive modification stuff, I was just saying with this kid at his age, we probably wouldn't. But later on in therapy, we would talk about some of his own beliefs about things and that, you know, if his mom takes his phone away, does that mean she's, she's going to leave him? Does that mean, is that um, she's abandoning him? Or kind of check out some of this stuff. But that would have to come pretty far down the line. Yeah, that's, cool. that's good, though, because um, in adolescent DBT, there's a skill that's not in adult DBT called think. Mm -hmm. It's about taking the perspective of the other person. Okay, so solution analysis. Uh, we talked about TIP. Uh, this is what we're go going to do with Garth. So we talked about TIP already. One of them is stop. And this amazes me. This just seems too simple. I mean, it's, you know, I, I have to tell you, don't tell the person who created it, but I kind of giggled when I saw it. I said, come on. You know, everybody's coming up with acronyms. But STOP works, and it's a lot of their favorite skills, so what do I know? Um, so it is STOP, you know, of course I can give him a big STOP sign, and so it's like STOP. Then take a step back from the situation. Observe what you're doing, observe what the other person's doing, and then proceed wisely, proceed mindfully. And it seems to work. You know, we're working on this, how do you get this impulsivity to give, how do you get a moment in there for someone to think about a skill? And so stop is one that I taught him right away and he used it. And then stop, I followed with tip, so that, because stop's only gonna work for a few minutes, right? But if I can get a, just a minute, then I can get him to do tip, then I've got some time. So stop and tip. And then, you know, he's saying, well, what about my mom? I think she should be in therapy because she's calling me all these names. So then I told him, dear man, you know, I shouldn't do this at a conference, right? <laughs> I made a mistake. I told him, dear man. And dear man is about how to ask for what you want. So he goes home and he says, as far as I can tell, what he repeated back to me, he did a really good dear man and asked his mom to please not call him names. Okay, so did Ma, does mom have the skills to respond to that? No. So he comes back and he said, he said I, I talked to my mom like you told me to. And I said, oh, great. And I'm already worried because I knew. And he said, yeah, she said if I just wouldn't do all this, that I would, she wouldn't have to call me names like that. She said, and I, 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 was, I was just going to drop out of school if I didn't get myself to school. And if I was going to try to get myself up, then how I had to show her that I could do it and call me a name. So I said, okay, and I owned it. I said, look, you know what? That was me. That's on me. So we haven't taught your mom the skills yet. That's what we need to do. But dear man is a skill that I'm going to teach him to use later when mom has more skills because he needs a way to communicate to her that this is hurting you know, and a lot of his behavior comes from this hurt, about this invalidation from his mom. And then I'm going to teach him relationship repair. Not yet, down the road. But he is apologizing. His mom is saying, you know, apologies aren't really cutting it anymore. And he can kind of get that. So relationship repair is what we teach someone to do to try to make up for what they've done. That you go to a person and you do something to repair to them the damage that you've done to the relationship. So you can apologize, but you also have to take action. And so we're going to teach him how to do that and then how to move on. Because remember on the far side of the chain, we've got shame. And I want to work on the shame. And that's one of the ways that we work on the shame. Um, we're going to do problem solving around his getting up. You know, he's on medication for ADHD, which we're evaluating. And he is, not me, but the psychiatrist, and we're going to look at how he can get to sleep earlier because he's really getting to sleep late and then it's hard for him to get up in the mornings and how he can get himself up. Those are all problem solving. We're writing down the steps for him so that he can see as we go through it. 
And then I've talked about the other two. Okay, so we do all that. I sit down, I teach him stop, I teach him tip, this is what you're going to do. And then I say, okay, tell me, you willing to do this? Yes, I've got commitment. And then I say, what could go wrong? Tell me all the things that could go wrong. And he does. And then we go back through and have ideas and, and solve the problem for the things that could go wrong. And he gets an experience at problem solving, plus he gets to tell me what his life's like. So this is why this won't work here. And he's a part of the process. Anything you want to add? No, yeah, that's good. I would, and we usually role play that. So, yes. you know, it's okay, lie down on the couch, your phone's here. He probably wouldn't let you, but I'm going to take, I'm going to pretend like you're asleep. I'm going to hide your phone in the office. I want you to wake up. I want you to see it. Here's the bowl of ice. Let's do it. You know, we would do this multiple times. What we and do is hide about, my phone. <laughs> right. We probably we hide Karen's phone. Good idea. Yeah. So doing that and then troubleshooting that, thinking, okay, if you were really at home in your own bedroom, what might, what might happen? Oh, I wouldn't have any ice or... You know, my be my I have to go to, through my sister's bedroom to get to the bathroom. I'm not going to do that, or you know, whatever. And one of the things he said was, "I don't have a bed." Hmm. Okay, so what I hope I have communicated is a little bit about what DBT is all about. That there's a structure to the session. There are other change techniques we use in addition to skills, that there's a whole lot going on in addition to just what we're saying. And there's, there's validation, there's dialectics, there's the philosophy of DBT, and there's stylistic strategies in the way that we talk. And so the, there's movement and flow. Our sessions, if you watch our sessions, you're going to see them speed up, slow down. There's going to be variety. And that's part of the way we keep the attention of the teenager and the client. Anything you want to add? Yeah, I guess, so I think it's interesting. I feel like DBT therapists are known as either being really, really rigid or being um, kind of overly identified and sort of softies, I feel like I hear. Um, and I, maybe we're a bit of both, right, in the dialectic of that. But I, to me, I can say I'm, I'm not a structure person. But this structure, working with BPD, you can't do work with BPD without having structure. So if any of you are working in here with BPD, you have to have some sort of structure. Otherwise, you will not be effective, um, or you'll just lose your own sanity. Um, because there's so much going on. Like, just you looked at what she wrote in the beginning about what was happening with Garth. And if you can't structure that, and even structure the agenda, <laughs> your 52 minutes will be chasing him around your office just trying to get him to sit down. <laughs> um, so there's. I think that the, the structure now feels really safe to me, and I like it. I used to butt up against it personally. Um, but it's not so rigid at the same time, because there's all this style stuff. So sometimes I'm laughing, and we're jumping around, and sometimes I'm really serious, and I've sort of withdrawn my warmth um, because of maybe something that's happening. And sometimes I'm really, really validating, and sometimes I'm really irreverent, and I'm joking in an irreverent way. Um, so it's really flexible, yet rigid at, at the same time. Do you guys know what irreverence is? Yes? Do you want an example? OK. So I'm not going to use Garth this time. Um, <laughs> I worked with a lovely uh, special ed teacher who had BPD for a very long time. And we worked together for a long time, and we had a really good relationship. And she had what she would do is she would call me and say, I can't do this. 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 I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. And so after time, she called me and said, I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this, I'm going to die, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. We had talked about that what she needed to do at those times was get on the treadmill, right? OK. I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this, I'm going to die. Well, uh, could you get on the treadmill first? <laughs> <laughs> That's irreverence. If I respond in this case, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, you're so upset, she's going to get worse. What the irreverence does is break through that. She laughed. Now, you have to have the relationship. You have the timing has to be right. But it can break through sometimes that emotionally controlled brain so that you can get to them. OK. Did we do it? How's our time? Good. We're Yay. good. Yes, right on time. <laughs> exactly.